This week has seen Gambia call on all women and girls in the country to report any sexual violence committed by former President Yahya Jame. Plus, the Libyan government confirmed that it has retaken the strategic town of Gravian following clashes with resurgent forces. This is Africa Focus. Here's a peek of the stories set in store today. Kenya's Regulatory Commission apprehends 16 suspects over illegal mixture and shortage of fuel. China-Africa summit attracts positive energy in relation to the Belt and Road Initiative. And African countries bid farewell to the African Women's World Cup. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter today is Tracy Dorcas. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. Ethiopia held a memorial on Tuesday for the army chief of staff, who was executed over the weekend along with four other senior government officials who led the failed coup attempt of the Amhara region. Soldiers and officers in uniform gathered for the ceremony in a large hall in central Addis Ababa, where the caskets of the army chief of staff, C.A. Makonen, and his retired general were carried into the hall, draped in Ethiopian flags. According to the Prime Minister's press secretary, a Samnu was shot on Monday near Amhara's capital, Bahirda. The killings are the biggest challenge yet to the sweeping political and economic reforms that the 42-year-old Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed kick-started after he took power in the Horn of Africa country in April 2018. <laughs> Democratic Republic of Congo opposition leader Jean Pierre Bemba was welcomed by thousands of supporters on his return to the capital Kinshasa on Sunday. Bemba was acquitted of war crimes by the International Criminal Court after serving 10 years in prison. He was barred from standing in the December election that voted in opposition leader Felix Shisekedi. Bemba joined the Lamuka coalition led by Martin Fayulu, who welcomed him at the airport on Sunday. On his Twitter feed, Bemba said he had come back to reinforce a unity of views and actions for a prosperous Congo. Protesters in Morocco paraded the streets, demanding for the easing of the abortion ban. The women on the streets are said to be victims of unwanted pregnancies and often have no means to even have proper birth procedures and end up undergoing unsafe abortions which involve termination of pregnancy by people lacking necessary skills or in an environment lacking minimal medical standards or both. However, this is strongly disputed, prompting most women to finally end up giving birth and throwing their babies on the streets. <laughs> Uganda is said to be a host for more than one million refugees from about five countries, with most of them originating from South Sudan. However, with the likes of Stephen Abe here, who is the South Sudanese refugee coach, the strengths of those children have been explored through their sharp football skills and in turn get an opportunity to engage in their talents. The camp that houses the refugees marks the launch of a three-year sports education program for refugees and Ugandans that will offer training, coaching and sports management courses. The activities also continue the work of peace building between refugees and hosting communities. <laughs> Kenya's court closed up the construction of a $2 billion Lamu coal project that faced years of resistance from local communities and environmentalists. Judge Mohamed Balala ordered under Section 1293B and C to undertake a fresh environmental impact assessment study following the terms of reference already formulated in January 2016 in the event that the second correspondent still wished to pursue the construction and operation of the project. The coal power station in the Lamu archipelago encountered years of resistance that led to the struggle of fighting against the coal power generation to ensure that the unique environment is intact. We begin today's show in Kenya, where the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Commission has apprehended 16 suspects over illegal mixture and storage of fuel in five sites within industrial area in the country and confiscated over 8,000 liters of contaminated fuel. Five dens operating illegal adulteration of fuel in industrial area Nairobi have been exposed by the energy regulator following a tip-off from members of the public. This comes even as the commission contemplates putting in place a cash reward scheme 
to reward those who volunteer information on unscrupulous fuel dealers. Fuel that comes out of this den, this illegal den, has a lot of impacts in terms of uh, public safety. In case a fire breaks out, you can see behind me, the activity is going on. People are busy working, welding and doing all that. If there is a fire breakout here, we lose a number of lives. Court proceedings from the 16 suspects are expected to take place on the various sites from Wednesday, 26th June, with some of the offences including illegal storage of fuel, operating without relevant licences, hence posing danger to the environment. Some of the offences can attract fines of up to 10 million Kenya shillings. The matter is before court. This site is going to be destroyed. We're going to break down everything here so that uh, uh, this activity does not take place any, anymore. According to IPRA's Enforcement and Consumer Protection Acting Director Cyprian Nyakundi, these are among a raft of measures being initiated by the Commission to curb unscrupulous fuel businesses as well as protect consumers of fuel. Musicians create music at a studio in Khartoum after a surge of freedom took over Sudan's underground music scene after the army ousted longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir in April following months of nationwide protests against his rule. From rap to Afrobeat, musicians living in Sudan and overseas have composed tunes punctuated by some of the protests' movement's most popular slogans. A surge of freedom has taken over Sudan's underground music scenes since the army ousted longtime ruler Omar al Bashir in April after months of nationwide protest against his rule. From rap to Afrobeat, musicians living in Sudan and overseas have composed tunes punctuated by some of protest movements' most popular slogans. When we are in the sitting, we try to sing with people all this music. A lot of the music that we did now have phrases from the revolution turned into melodies and songs. That's the whole idea. So During Bashir's iron-fisted rule of three decades, Sudanese rappers had been unable to express themselves openly. Musicians still remember the festive, carnival-like atmosphere at the protest camp before the bloodshed. You see, the relationship between music and, 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 and the sittings are the chants. Because there's no music, so it's all about the chants. And it's focused on the lyrics, on the words of what they say inside, you know. That's what brings up the people. We, as if you still keep reminding them of why we're here. You know, that's the purpose of that. For singer Maman, the sit-in was a replica of a utopian society where democracy flourished. The voice of Sudan's uprising was primarily spread on the internet, which has been largely cut since the crackdown. Maman, who is 28, is still shocked by the death of his friend Mohamed Mata in the June 3rd raid. I'm kind of freaked out a little bit for my daughter, like she might... I don't want her to face what we're facing in another 20 years, 10 years, you know. I don't want her to be going out again against the next president. You get me? So, so we'll find a way. We'll find a political way. Gadora, who has been composing music since 2006, has often resorted to metaphors to make political insinuations. It started, I would say, six months ago, where uh, uh, a major wave took in. Most of the Sudanese artists, they started producing revolutionary songs or even revolutionary uh, related production, even visual production. So uh, it, it was a huge wave. Medics linked to the protesters say at least 128 people have been killed in the crackdown on demonstrators, the majority of them on June 3rd. Officials have given a lower death toll of 61 nationwide for that. South African NGOs are taking the state to court, accusing it of violating people's constitutional right to a healthy environment. At the heart of the case is one of the most polluted areas in the world, the South African High Veld, a region where hundreds of people die prematurely from health issues, victims of an invisible killer. The people of Mpumalelweni, a township in the Mpumalanga province, are suffocating. Asimale has been an asthmatic since she was four months old. Her mask is useless to her since medical oxygen is too expensive. Her mother feels like there is only one solution. I wish to move away, yeah. I wish to move away because this place is not right. A few streets away, Lifa suffers from the same symptoms. His breathing problems began when he moved to the Highfelt region two hours outside of Johannesburg. I find it difficult to breathe. Sometimes I feel like I'm really going to die. It's bad. 
The region alone produces 80% of South African coal and is one of the most polluted in the world. According to environmental groups, between 300 and 650 people die each year from respiratory diseases linked to pollution. It's very clear that there are some people who come from other provinces and when they get to Middlebank or around Highfield, they start getting sick because of respiratory um, illnesses, uh, allergic rhinitis and all that. When they leave this area, we find that some of them get better. The national electricity company ESCOM owns the 12 coal plants in the region. Local activists say blame lies with the state because the South African constitution is one of the few globally that guarantees people's right to a healthy environment. They are violating our rights. They are violating our right to clean air. They are violating our right to health. That's the truth. According to the government, the air in the high felt is already cleaner than it was a few years ago. But they admit that real improvement will take time. Sadly, for many patients, it may be too late to avoid the deadly effects of pollution. Chinese development projects in Africa must be sustainable. The government's top diplomat told senior African ministers on Tuesday as it denounced outside forces who seek to vilify cooperation by accusing China of creating debt traps. This comes after Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged $60 billion to African nations at a China-Africa summit on cooperation in September, matching the size of funds offered at the previous summit in Johannesburg in 2015. In 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced the launch of both the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Infrastructure Development and Investment Initiatives that would be stretching from East Asia to Europe. This project was eventually termed the Belt and Road Initiative. Some analysts, however, have seen the project as an unsettling extension of China's rising power. Despite this, Chinese State Councillor Wang Yi told foreign and other ministers from 50 African countries at a Beijing forum that his country does not seek to pursue selfish geopolitical gains in Africa and would never impose its will on others. For some time, some outside forces have tried to vilify and undermine China-Africa cooperation by cooking up so-called neocolonialism and debt traps and so on which are totally groundless and are not acceptable by African people. Such attempts expose a total lack of respect for Africa, lack of understanding about China and absence of knowledge about the true friendship between China and Africa that has stood the test of time. According to Wang, Chinese development projects in Africa must be sustainable and that African countries are running up a debt they won't be able to pay back, including to China, and shouldn't expect to be bailed out by Western-sponsored debt relief. Beijing has denied engaging in debt trap diplomacy and Xi said in September, government debt from Chinese interest-free loans due by the end of the year would be written off for the poorest African nations. Regarding China-Africa's work relationship, it is only Chinese and African people who have the most authority to speak about this. According to an IMF report released last year, Africa is currently facing another potential debt crisis with about 40% of low-income countries in the region now in debt distress or at a high risk of being unable to repay back their loans. Coming up after the break. This year's Women's World Cup has quite been extraordinary for the continent after two African teams, Cameroon and Nigeria, advanced to the round of 16. We're about to pay some bills. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Keep it switch. Welcome back to Africa Focus. This year's Women World Cup has been a historic one for African football. For the first time ever, two African teams, Cameroon and Nigeria, advanced to the knockout rounds. South Africa also qualified for the tournament for the first time, but did not advance outside of the group stages. Victory would give the facing elimination from the Women's World Cup and desperately searching for a late goal to push them through to the knockout rounds. 
Cameroon countered a late New Zealand throw-in with a burst forward towards the football farm's net in the 95th minute. It was Cameroon's goal, but most of the credit went to midfielder Ajaran Chuot, who was also responsible for her team's first goal of the day. The 26-year-old, who plays for Norwegian club Valerenga, received the ball 50 yards from goal, charged forward, deck New Zealand defender Rio Pavesial twice, and slotted in one of the goals of the tournament that aided the team to go through. Cameroon into the knockout stages. In the knockout stage, Cameroon lost 3-0, a loss that was marked by three decisions that Cameroon felt aggrieved by, with two of the goals involving the video assistant referee. The first incident was a call by Chinese referee Ken Liang to award England an indirect free kick for a back pass in the 13th minute that led to Steve Hongson's opening goal. The latter two VR reviews, according to fans, did not favor the African team. Nigeria. Elsewhere, Africa's record champion Super Falcons of Nigeria hope that fortunes will favor them one more time as they took on Germany at the Stade des Alps in Grenoble after qualifying as the third best having beaten South Korea 2-0. However, they lost 1-0 to France and then got eliminated by Germany after going down three times without a reply. Goal, Lea Schuller. Okay, they recycle the... Banyana Banyana of South Africa started the tournament on a false footing as they first lost 3-1 to Spain one -one. with one player down. They then lost 1-0 to China and later got thrashed by Germany 4-0 and got knocked out. Tucked away by Lina Magul. South Africa bowed out with no point and goals, while Cameroon and Nigeria bowed out with one win and three points. The finals of the FIFA Women's World Cup will be played on 7th of next month. The Fulani are mostly known as nomadic herders in Nigeria's north. Besides his day-to-day -day business, King Mohammed Abu Bakr is also a sought-after advisor whose audience believe in when it comes out to sorting problems. Every month at the palace, the ritual remains the same. The king of the Fulani is dressed with a turban by his assistant. After a brief meeting with his emissaries, the council of traditional leaders begins. Most of the time, uh, the, uh, the people come and bring their problems, you know, to me, and we try our best to see how we're going to solve it. If it is something we can solve, we do it immediately. If it is not, we give them time to come back. Or if it is, if it's something that has to do with the law enforcement, we talk to the law enforcement. Land disputes, family quarrels, attacks, and armed robberies are all on the agenda. The king of the Fulani people in Lagos is called upon for any community-related problem. It is a community that also suffers from discrimination. The Fulani are regularly accused of being at the root of deadly violence between farmers and herders in central Nigeria. Anywhere you see a Fulani man, people see them as killers. But it's not true. A Fulani man is a wonderful person. He accommodates, he likes his people, he likes his, um, uh, his neighbors. He, 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 he interacts, you know, he's a very social person, a Fulani man. But you know what? There is no society that there's no bad, bad, bad ex. Mohamed Bombardo is also an influential businessman. For three generations, his family has developed a major dock workers company in the port of Lagos. Like his royal title, he inherited the family business, yes. which he continues to grow despite coming from a minority ethnic group collaborate very well, we think very well. Now, yes, there will be issues, but issues will not be trashed out on the level of where I come from. It's on the basis of that objectivity of what the issue is, not of the color. I mean, not that I'm misunderstood. No, we don't, issues should not be seen in that light, no. The Muslim Fula Hausa community that Muhammad oversees accounts for 5 million of the 20 million people living in Lagos. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you. So make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV channel 268 and on Azam TV channel 138, including Zuku channel 53. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this exciting journey. 
do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Keep it switched.